David, uh, thank you for joining us here at the Wesleyan Center for the Humanities. Thanks for having me here. Uh, I am uh, Assistant Professor of English and American Studies here at Wesleyan. Uh, you are Associate Professor of English and some other things too yeah, at yeah. the University of Pennsylvania. Correct. Um, and uh, I wondered if we might begin by talking a little bit about your current book project, which I take it uh, moves across sort of three moments of uh, so fresh articulations of freedom in the 19th century. Well, the book is called The Brink of Freedom, mm -hmm. Improvising Life in the 19th Century Atlantic World. And um, as you said, it touches down in three moments um, in the mid 19th century. First being um, the black settler colonization of uh, Liberia between 1820 and 1860. Uh -huh. And the second being this conflict over the census of 1840 in the United States mm -hmm. um, and, and its relationship to an uprising on a slave ship called the Creole. Mm -hmm. And then finally, um, <clears throat> the third part uh, that I'm going to talk about tonight talks about the um, 1847 uprising of Maya on the Yucatan Peninsula that came to be known as La Guerra de Castas, or the Caste War. These oh, yes. three moments are not linked in traditional ways, like there aren't the same people in each moment, or there aren't right. there aren't linked through intellectual history directly. Uh -huh. um, but they are linked um, in the sense of being movements that are kind of unheralded, understudied, uh -huh. maybe. Uh -huh. yeah. Um, yeah. They're also, in some ways, failed movements. They're not big revolutions that, like we think of the period, like. Haiti or right um, or the French Revolution or, or the French Revolution, Revolution or yeah. anything like that. Uh -huh. Yeah, they're they're not those kind of moments. They're moments that um, have left vast archives mm -hmm. um, that still I think speak to us today. Uh -huh. um, but they are also um, moments that um, uh, whose archives haven't been read and who I think we actually we don't know how to read their archives so well. So there's a kind of there's a there's a kind of pitch for a new method of reading too in this Definitely. book as I take it right. Okay. Yeah. Can you say a little bit more about that because you've been using a phrase overreading. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, I, I, which I like as a phrase. I think I've it's a great, great phrase. Yeah. <laughs> lost, there's so much talk these days uh, of uh, surface reading and right. different kinds of reading but right. I am how close is too close when you're reading right? Exactly. This is, this is very close. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. I, I'm obsessed with method. I like the idea of um um having one method kind of critically interrupt another yes, in the midst yeah. of working on an archive uh -huh, and seeing uh -huh. what happens. Yeah. So, yeah. so uh, like a more specific example, um, the, in the Liberia project, I'm, my main archive is these letters that black settlers wrote mm -hmm. from, Li who came from the U.S. They, these were folks who were enslaved in the U.S. primarily mm -hmm. and were freed on the condition that they deport, be deported to, mm -hmm. to Liberia. Right. And um, once they arrived, um, they started uh, writing letters back to their f former masters as well as their family and friends. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of letters. Mm -hmm. And we have these many of these letters. And to the extent that they've been read, which is not very often, um, they have been read as um, um, texts that give us information, material, like um, material yes. histories of what, what people did uh -huh. um, and why they did it. Yeah. So, for instance, there's a lot in the letters asking for blankets and seeds. Mm -hmm. um, to be sent from the U.S. So I was frustrated for a long time reading uh -huh. those letters. I was just yeah. like, enough about seeds and blankets. So like, you know, <laughs> like I want to see somebody say something really about freedom. grandiose, <laughs> you know? Right. And I realized um, finally that um, it's in that language of the everyday, on uh -huh. the one hand, uh -huh. where um, living free is expressed. Uh -huh. And on the other hand, sometimes in and amongst the pages and pages and many sentences about blankets and seeds, um, you get sometimes just a phrase, mm -hmm. maybe a whole sentence, maybe a few sentences, mm -hmm. in which um, these people do reflect um, very self-consciously and critically on um, what they're doing there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what they're finding mm -hmm. and how their expectations are being um, fulfilled or thwarted. Mm -hmm. And um, I realized that, that I didn't really have the skills to read these documents, which after all are not supposed to be theoretical documents. They're supposed to be... Yes. Um, history, um, kind of just um, archives that are documents that tell us about the everyday from which we theorize, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. if we are ourselves smart enough. Right, and, right, uh, right, I, right. I thought, look, they're writing these letters maybe 10, 15 years after one of the great 19th century theories of freedom was written, Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What happens if we read these letters as as if it, they were a text, a philosophical text like mm -hmm. Hegel's text, mm -hmm. what would we find? Mm -hmm. And that's really mm -hmm. what I, I've been trying to do. 
um, read these texts that are not granted theoretical status mm -hmm. theoretically as yes. theoretical texts. Yes. But this, and this gets called overreading sometimes. Can you say a word about how the three parts of the book come together to mm -hmm. sort of to give a picture of yeah. if it is a picture or, or what kinds of pictures of freedom are being yeah. thought through and acted out yes. in the 19th century? Yes. Well, each, you know, what links the three moments uh, is what I said about them being kind of unheralded, understudied, mm -hmm. but also each for each moment, generically, the, the letter, the epistolary ah. form is really important. Yeah. Um, so you have a scene, the texts are set in scenes, mm -hmm. and those scenes are scenes of writing to and hearing from people, yes. right? Yes. They're dialogical mm -hmm. The content of, if we can say it that way, of the uh -huh. freedom that, that is expressed in each moment is really different. Yeah. So taking Liberia, for instance, again, um, I was really struck by you know the name the word liberia means freedom mm -hmm. uh, comes from the latin for freedom and the project was set up by um, uh, white abolitionists in the u.s who were um, also racist in the sense that they uh, wanted to get rid of slavery in the u.s but they also wanted to get rid of black people mm -hmm. so um, they thought the perfect perfect solution was to um, free uh, African Americans from slavery and deport them. Mm -hmm. And um, so their idea was to, as they understood it, send African Americans back to Africa or to their yes. homeland. Yes. Now, of course, these actual people were many, many generations removed from Africa, and many of them certainly didn't come from where Liberia was. So, and, and as it turns out, almost no one, not a single one of the very few of the 19,000 or so um, immigrants thought of themselves as going back to Africa. Mm -hmm. they, sure. That was uh, a language that was used by the white advocates of the program, not the participants in it. Mm -hmm. They thought of themselves, they thought of the uh, United States as home, mm -hmm. and they thought of themselves as going to a place that um, was full of natives, who, native West Africans, mm -hmm. whom they were wary of, suspicious of, um, and when they got and they had hopes that they might be able to establish a life, a free life there, but they, they seem not to have really known exactly um, what that freedom would consist in. And when they get there, they often um, find themselves, they write of themselves as, f for instance, um, feeling most free when they return, when they think about return not to Africa, mm -hmm. but to the United States. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those returns take a number of forms. Sometimes they're just imaginative returns. They write a lot about um, uh, what life was like back in, in the United States to people in the United States. Mm -hmm. They ask after friends and, and family and kin. Mm -hmm. um, they send advice. Mm -hmm. um, and so they also, and they also um, talk about what it was like to be enslaved mm -hmm. and how it, that was different from being free. And that distinction is not as sharp as we might think about it mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. um, which, which teaches us, I think, that formal emancipation, being formally freed, um, isn't always the be-all and end-all of freedom yes. as such. Yes. And sure. in many ways, many of these settlers long to come back to the United States. And that's almost unspeakable in the way that we think about emancipation from slavery. Like, to return to the US would be to return to formal chattel slavery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Many pined for that. Right. I wonder if we could switch gears for a minute and yeah. talk about some of the other work you're doing, which it sounds to me may be connected, although I'm, I'm interested to hear precisely yeah. how it's connected, <laughs> yeah. uh, which is your work on the uh, legacy of the Armenian genocide. Mm, um, right, definitely. I know this, I, I sense this has a kind of scholarly dimension and a personal dimension as well. It, yeah. it does, it uh -huh. does. I, I became really interested in how Armenians in the North American diaspora um, represented in in contemporary culture, I mean, in popular culture and other forms of culture, represented the legacy of catastrophic loss, mm -hmm. which we often call genocide. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and um, I felt like there were certain ways of representing that catastrophic loss that were caught in a kind of vicious tautological cycle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and those ways are the ones that are most familiar to Armenian diasporans. They're the, they're the modes that, um, that most um, people in the diaspora learn like from childhood, uh -huh. and um, they're the modes that the political parties and organizations 
are always advocating, mm -hmm. namely um, recognition by the world that the genocide happened because yes. it's denied by um, lots of um, states, mm -hmm. including um, the state of Turkey, mm -hmm. um, uh, and some sort of reparation yes. um, for the losses. Right. And sometimes the reparation takes the form of simple recognition, uh -huh. and that's uh -huh. imagined to be something that would be reparative. Right. Um, other times it's more specific, like land or money or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. The fantasy was that there would be, we would be made whole again. We, yes. Armenians, would yes. be made whole again uh -huh. if Turkey just said that it happened. And right. people are very attached to that idea, and I've never really understood that. Like, uh -huh. I've never understood what that would provide, and I imagine that um, it, it wouldn't provide the kind of... Um, uh, reparation that's imagined. And indeed, for a long time, there, the argument was, well, Armenians need a, a nation state, not yes. just a state in the Soviet Union, but yes. an independent nation state um, to be fully repaired. And lo and behold, um, we got one. But mm -hmm. as it turns out, Armenians in the U.S. didn't flock to Yerevan because right. <laughs> uh, it didn't have electricity for you know twelve hours a day. Right, and right It wasn't right. Uh, as comfortable as being in the U.S. for many. There would be a lot to long for back home. In yeah. That case. Right. So, right. so that didn't do it. Right. Uh -huh. So, uh -huh. so I'm interested in ways that um, people have thought, tried to work through, or remember, mm -hmm. or uh, that catastrophic loss, or. The ways that, um, for instance, Armenians and Turks have been um, doing, working together collaboratively today in, in the art world um, uh, on projects that aren't always just about the genocide, mm -hmm. but that are about the many ways that we share deeply so many aspects of our culture, or language, food, mm -hmm. history. Well, it sounds like we've, uh, we've covered a lot of ground historically, mm -hmm. theoretically, politically, but in a way we're covering uh, the same ground again and again in a very productive way. Yeah, uh, and sort of relationships between uh, official history and unofficial history right. and uh, ways of thinking about um, freedom that may not be part of the uh, dominant narratives of freedom in the 19th century and today, too. Yeah, thanks Thanks for making connections among parts of my work that I often think of as, as separate. I, I, I learned a lot about that, <laughs> even just sitting here well, talking with you. Well, it's been a great pleasure talking with you. Uh, and thank you again for joining us well, here thanks. at the Wesleyan Center for the Humanities.